We had a small window and this was life or death. It all started in 2020 when Diana Kirangi visited her doctor for a sore shoulder. Two years and multiple visits later, she still had no answers and was sent for an angiogram. They pushed me out into recovery and I'm like, oh, they probably haven't found anything. What a waste of time coming up here. And this medical officer comes and he goes, you need a triple bypass. And I'm like, what? He goes, you've got three blocked artery, one's at 25%, one's at 75% and one's at 55%. And I said, are you sure you've got the right person? He goes, yes, it's, it's you. And I said, no, 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 I can't. He said, why not? I said, because my nutrition is awesome, I'm fit, I'm healthy. And I said, I can't. He goes, no, nah, you do. You need a triple bypass. Because at that time, two months later, we would have been getting married. And all I could think about was, oh my God, they're going to cut me open. He goes, do you have any questions for me? I said, yeah. I was like, what's your success rate? And he goes, excuse me? And I said, what's your success rate? He goes, are you asking me if anyone's died um, under my hands? I said, that's exactly what I'm asking you. And he goes, no one. Reassured the surgery was straightforward and had been performed successfully thousands of times. The family said their goodbyes and Diane was wheeled into surgery. After waiting anxiously for more than 12 hours at 2.30 a.m., the phone rang. We knew something was really wrong once that phone call came through. The, the voice on the other end um, sort of made your stomach sort of churn because they too were speaking a broken voice. So they knew that the anxiety that was up and they probably had a good understanding of the dilemma that Diane was in at that point in time. The surgery had life-threatening complications. This is what my surgeon said. He said, as soon as we opened you up and we touched your heart, it just went boom. It spasmed so hard that we've never ever seen anything like it. He said, we did the triple bypass and it didn't work. He said, we then harvest the vein on your leg to do a quadruple bypass, and that didn't work either. He said, you arrested three times on the table, two small ones, and one big one that I, I had to reach in and manually pump. They said, we didn't know what to do. You had a lot of surgeons in the room with you, a lot of experience, and we were all flabbergasted. They said they um, didn't think I'd last the hour and basically told my family that I wouldn't make it. Like, if she does make it, which we is highly unlikely, um, they'll be, she'll need to be here for 14 weeks recovery. She won't be able to walk, talk or remember anything. The family was told they had one hour to say their final goodbyes. Our conversation was all around the boys. Other than our bond was being there for the boys and the boys were here. And they were, you know, talking in her ear and, you know, as, as far as our corridor was, you know, Staying there for them, if anything. Ten-year-old Ignatius and six-year-old Tiawa had to endure the sight of their mum straight off the operating table. Put it on the line that you know, mum is extremely close to to dying, and we need to be there for mum. Ignatius was all all tears and everything, and he was in and out of the spaces. Um, but no, Tiawa wouldn't move. He was just there. Um, love you mum, love you mum, love you mum, love you mum. With her body fighting to stay alive, her mind was fighting another terrifying battle. When I was in a coma, like I was seeing things like they were real. So I could see myself dead in a box. 
like looking down. I was standing at the end of my feet, looking down. He would see talks about his cousin Booker all the time. And he was there too. He was kind of looking after me, positioning my body in this coffin. I remember trying to give him messages. I can still hear. It was like I turned my back and I just flew as fast as I could. And I ended up back here in Gizzy. And I was hovering above Pohorauri Marae. And I could see all the people gathering for my tangi, lots of them. But there was not, they were waiting for my body to arrive, but nobody was coming. And that's what I thought. Maybe I'm going to be all right. While in the coma, I could hear my boys, Tiawa, saying, I love you, Mama. And Naish going, fight, Mum, fight. Man, I fought the hardest fight for them. Diane had multiple procedures before her chest was closed and her incredible recovery began. She would have to relearn to walk, talk and eat, but no one had prepared her for what she would see when she had her first shower. I took my clothes off and I looked in the mirror and I was like, didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Just my whole chest was just like purple. And it's hard to cope with, especially when you're being so active and you care about your body. You know, laugh because you actually pulled through the surgery and cry because you look freaking ugly, you know. As word got out that Di was in a coma, fighting for her life, the support came flooding in. So many messages, and all very similar, actually. The few words, you know, that most people said were, um, if anyone can do it, you can, you know. And messages from people that I didn't even know. Hi Di, you don't know me, but I know you. I heard you're unwell, yeah. Speedy recovery, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, that's something that I'll never forget. If anyone can do it, you can. Just being a mongrel, eh, I suppose. <laughs> Close that chapter. Close that chapter, yeah. Move on, eh? 16 months on, and Rewati and Dai count every day as a blessing. I'm extremely proud of, you know, having that fortitude to come through that level of trauma, to be here today with us. You know, every day is a great day. I had two boys and they need me. And I was ready to go. And I, I wasn't gonna go without a fight anyway. In January, Diane and Rewati finally had their happy ending, marrying in Gisborne, surrounded by their friends and family. <laughs>